Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone to please turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the meeting? Apologies have been received from Oliver Mundell, who I'm happy to announce has become a father, and we send congratulations to his wife on the birth of baby Isla. And I would like to welcome Alison Harris this morning, who will be substituting. We have also received apologies from Tavish Scott, MSP. Agenda item one is a continuation of our STEM inquiry. This is the third evidence session on the committee STEM in early years education inquiry. And can I welcome to committee this morning, this morning Nicola Connor, class teacher, Nicola Dasgupta, class teacher and vice convener of the Education Committee, EIS Scotland. Uh, Dr. Simon Gage, Director of Edinburgh Science, and Matt Lanc Lancashire, sorry, Director of Policy and Public Affairs, Scottish Council for Development and Industry, and Catherine Thomas, who is a Primary Science Development Officer for the RAISE project. And a very warm, warm welcome to you. Can I maybe begin by asking you just to give a very brief outline of your experience in this area? And if we could come to you first, Miss Corner. Uh, yeah. I'm a primary teacher in Peel Primary School in West Lothian Council. Um, I am currently primary one. I, I have an interest in early years. I've taught from nursery to primary three. I'm currently at the end of my master's in early years pedagogy, uh, with my dissertation focusing on to what extent is it possible to teach science through play, with a play-based pedagogy. Um, and I'm also the science development officer just now for West Lothian, with my remit as the CERC and Primary Science Teachers Trust Sustain and Extend programme, after being the lead on the cluster programme as part of the CERC as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Desgupta. Hi there. Um, I, I'm a primary school teacher. Um, I teach primary five at the moment, although I've taught across all areas of um, uh, the primary stages. Um, I'm interested in STEM in terms of how it fits in across the curriculum in a kind of broader sense. Uh, and I wouldn't say I consider myself to have any kind of specialism in it, other than, you know, just being interested as a teacher. Okay, yes. And so I'm uh, seconded out at the moment. I'm a primary school teacher by trade, but um, at the moment part of the RAISE programme for Highland Council. So it's providing high quality CPD to teachers across the area. So I work mostly with teachers um, across the college network and um, with sometimes with the pupils as well. Okay. Uh, SCDI uh, deliver the Young Engineers and Science Clubs, YSC. Uh, that's our critical interest, obviously, uh, in this evidence session, uh, the club has 1,500 schools in its network across Scotland and, and 30,000 boys and girls all participating in that. Uh, the clubs are there to infuse uh, an interest in STEM uh, through hands-on STEM projects, encourage young people to make good subject choices around STEM as they come up, and better inform uh, young people and teachers about the range of careers available in STEM. Uh, particularly with the AI and data agenda upon us and the fourth industrial revolution, and critically to encourage uh, more girls to uh, pick up STEM based subjects and participate within them. Dr. Gage? Uh, I'm Simon Gage. I was a scientist, research scientist, and the last 30 years I've been working for what you probably would call Edinburgh Science Festival. We recently renamed Edinburgh Science. So we put on the two-week science festival in Edinburgh that uh, gets 150,000 people, ordinary people who, uh, with whom we spend time trying to encourage them to find STEM more interesting and, and exciting. We also run Generation Science, which tours all of Scotland, taking practical workshops and shows into primary schools that sees about 55 to 60,000 primary school children in all 32 local authorities. And, and interfaces about 3,000 primary school teachers. We also run a careers event called Careers Hive, which is aimed at secondary school pupils who are making the decisions about what subjects they should study to try and get them excited about the possibilities of continuing their STEM study. Um, so that's our scholarship experience. We also work internationally a lot, so we also interface with other nations who are sitting here discussing exactly the same issues and uh, so perhaps have some insight into how others are dealing with it. 
Thank you very much. Just before we move to questions, could I declare an interest as I am the Vice Chair of CERC and a member of the British Computer Society. And um, I'll open with questions from the committee and move to Mr Gray, first of all. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I had a question to start with, which is really for uh, Catherine. Um, so the committee, uh, one of the things the committee have <coughs> been looking at is um, how we can move from uh, programmes and pilots and so on to um, bringing STEM learning in early years and primary into the mainstream. And um, one of the programmes which uh, witnesses often talk to us about in a very positive way is the RAISE programme, and you've been involved in that. Um, and that's good, but in your evidence, you say that next year there's no funding for your programme. So um, is that not an indication of the work you've done is going to, to go to waste, really? Well, when we looked at the, the external, the Robert Owen Centre did an external evaluation of the RAISE project, and what they their findings said that um, the RAISE programme has worked really successfully when local authorities have got behind it. Not to say that Highland Council hasn't got behind it, but there has been a funding issue within Highland and that it's austerity budgets and that at the moment lots of additional sport needs posts are being cut. So there isn't a way that Highland Council is going to fund a development officer to carry on. So we are looking for external funding to continue it. The RAISE programme is very keen for us to continue and if funding is secured, we can still be part of the RAISE network but it's just that the external funding to secure the salary for the posts won't be there. It would have to come from external funding. So, so you so, are the raised development officer, so you've been yes. seconded to that role. Yes. So if you can't find external funding, you'll go back yeah, to... Yeah, go back to classroom to teaching. teaching. Yeah. Which I okay. feel we have, it's been an excellent programme to be part of in Highland Schools of benefited from it greatly, but it's just given the pol political nature of what's happening in Highland Council at the moment. Okay, so how long have you been on secondment? Theresa? I've been out, it's been a two-year pilot project okay. that Highland's been part of. I've been out for nine months, my colleague's been out for just over a year, so we've had four development officers uh, within the two-year time scale. Okay, what's, so, what's the scale of funding that you've had or you need? What's, what's the gap that we're talking about? Um, I think to keep two development officers out, is it? Um, I think it's 100,000 for the year, I okay. think. Okay, all right. And d did Highland Council fund that from the start and have chosen not to then, or was there funding from somewhere else that...? It, the funding comes through partly from the Wood Foundation and uh -huh. partly from Highland Council, so okay. they did initially put some... So is the Wood, Wood Foundation funding still there, or were the council expected to pick that up after...? Yeah, the Wood yeah. Foundation funding was for the two years. Right. So, and then that's the end of the pilot project. But the wonderful thing about the RAISE project was when it was um, given to Highland Council, it's two years, but it's not just giving money to councils. They have to have a sustainable view of a longer term view of what they want to go forward. So in Highland Council, what they've gone for is the Newton Room approach, uh -huh. which is between for P6 to S2. So that's um, in development at the moment for funding of five Newton rooms. Um, and that's, there's two of them up and running, and the other three are in progress. So the money was given from the Wood Foundation for a sort of transition period between that happening, and that's not quite year yet, which is why we're applying for the external funding to try and keep okay. that going. But, but it's fair to say that you, you've been doing work which you feel positive about yes. and promoting STEM and supporting primary teachers and delivering STEM in the yeah. classroom and yes. that's going to be lost. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we feel so because, as I say, the Newton rooms, that their emphasis is on P6 to S2, right. whereas we've okay. worked with early years practitioners sure. as well. Yeah. Okay, in, in your um, evidence, you, you point to another barrier, which is your impression that teachers are working at capacity so they don't really have any space to um to 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 engage with stem even if they want to and you also make the point that you think that amongst the teachers you work with they think stem is important but it's not as important as other things and i just wondered if you could 
say a bit more about that? Yeah, I think it's when I've gone in and I've been asked to do a CPD session and we've got teachers, the whole schools come along and you can see teachers have had a hard day. The last thing they want to do is to have some training. They just want to be in their classrooms getting ready for the next day or sorting out on their paperwork. But the positive thing about STEM is that once we've gone in and we've delivered our session, the evaluation's always been really positive and people are happy and they can see that they've got something that they can take back with them to the classroom the next day and something that feeds into their literacy or feeds into their numeracy. So we're giving them strategies um, so it's, uh, although they're coming and we've had, you can sense the sort of negativity at the start of oh, STEM, it's another thing, it's another thing I've got to think about. I think at the end of the sessions they see the value in, in what we've been delivering. Okay. Do, when you say you think that they see other things as more important, other subjects as more important, is that literacy and numeracy? What? Literacy, numeracy, health and well-being, okay. because that's what they're being accountable for so to that's their head teachers. Being... Right. And, yeah. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, uh, Ms Smith. Uh, um, Dr Gage, you said something very interesting in your opening uh, statement that you had been looking at international evidence. Could you give us an outline of some of that international evidence and whether you think there's any lessons that can be learnt for Scotland from that? Um, well, it's hard. So what, what I experience, I can share only my experience. So if I sit in a room of people from Ministry of Education in Malaysia or in Indonesia or Singapore, they're all talking about exactly the same issue. There's some, I mean, there's some very good research done. Uh, I would point you towards the Rose study, for example, that maps the attitudes of young people towards STEM subjects by the level of affluence of a nation. And as a nation becomes wealthier, the interest in science, technology, engineering, maths diminishes. Uh, it's almost like a law of nature. So when you get down to the Japanese girls, they have no interest because it's about the, the richest nation or, or, or highly developed nation. So, you, so as nations develop, they're all facing the same issues that the interest in these subjects diminishes. But, but they're also sitting around saying, we have to do more. We have to inspire our teachers to do more. We have to... Um, uh, provide additional resources and support in the classroom. So I suppose the thing that you come back with is is some degree of terror, really, because w whilst we have a, you know, perhaps one might regard it as a head start in terms of uh, the great history of science and technology in a country like Scotland, the rest of the world is is overtaking us, or, or at least our, at our at our heels and dealing with it in exactly the same way. And so if one were to think that th this discussion relates in part not only to the sort of the, the inspiration of young people and, the, and the, their acquisition of useful skills, but to the wider context of, of the vibrancy of a nation, then you sort of come away thinking, my goodness, we've got to get on with this and we've got to succeed at this. We really do need an education system that produces the best out of everybody because if not, we're going to be left in, in the lay-by. Uh, so that, I suppose that is what I took, took a, take away from it, although I, I have to say I haven't been and seen things better. You know, you, I, haven't, I can't tell you, go to Singapore, they've solved the problem. Uh, you see aspects, actually, that are, are somewhat troubling, you know, students doing 12-hour days yeah, yeah. or being Indeed. grilled to pass the PISA test. And things like that. So I think it's not. I can't point to the the solution, but I can certainly point to the competition. Do, do you have examples of uh, what you would consider to be best practice in some of these countries where you feel that considerable progress is being made in the development of the same subjects for uh, younger children? I mean, other examples that you feel we should be looking at? Um, I, I honestly, I don't actually. No, I think it's a universal problem. Um, I. I've been to schools in countries that are well funded and I've seen amazing labs. I've been to schools in China where the labs are better than any lab I ever went through, uh, whether it's IT or whether it's, it, it, it's chemistry, biology. So you can visit places where people have spent a lot of money and the resources are, have been applied, mm. um, so not ubiquitously, I have to say. <laughs> Just in that context, I mean, if you, you you said very clearly that you believe that other countries are um, overtaking Scotland and certainly uh, catching up with us, um, presumably there is a reason for that. Do you feel that 
these reasons are more to do with general economic uh, profile and improvement, or do you think there are specific aspects of education um, that are allowing these countries to make that faster progress? Um, I, I don't don't know about enough about their educational systems to be able to comment on that, but certainly one gets a sense of priority. The, the wealth of these nations is pinned squarely on becoming capable as technological entrepreneurs. Okay. And there's a link there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I um, just, just briefly ask um, the practitioners about one of the, the, the themes has been about teacher confidence uh, and um, uh, especially in the early years in primary. Um, you want to comment about your experience of, of, of what it's like in your own schools? Maybe go to Ms Connor first. Um, I think as part of, obviously being part of the CERC cluster programme, that main aim is to raise teacher confidence within our cluster. Um, so we have science mentors in every school. We have seven schools, sorry, six schools, one early year centre uh, within our cluster. And we have a science mentor in every, in every school, even though after we did the programme 2016, 2017, a couple of the teachers, the mentors have left um, for promoted posts or different authorities there has been a mentor who has taken over. Um, and I think that's very important that not only have the mentors uh, ask someone to take on the role of the, the, the mentor in the school, but actually the skills and everything that they learnt with CERC and with themselves, they've now taken that on and disseminated into other authorities or into other schools they've now moved on to. Um, there are, of course, teacher confidence, but you could say that about music, you could say that about drama. People have different interests, have different... I don't have a science background um, at all. Mine is drama and music. Um, so I think when I got asked to go along to do the, the cluster programme for myself, it was about my professional development and get um, ideas and just the enthusiasm from CERC and the, the training that you get is so high quality that um, you come back enthusiastic and motivated and you want everyone to feel the same. Um, but when we're running the CLPL just now for the Sustain and Extend programme, I'm having to turn teachers away and put on a waiting list. I would say the only thing, barrier I've learned this year is, because it's so practical and hands-on, you can maybe only have 20, 25 teachers attend at a time, where actually I'm getting 30, 40 teachers who want to come along and want to, to uh, their skills to be progressed or to learn new ideas. Um, the most successful one we had was at Christmas. We ran, the science mentors throughout the authority ran a science with Santa. <laughs> we had mince pies, cups of tea, um, very informal, so that people didn't feel threatened. They could come along um, and they could dip in and out of activities, take light years away. The professional dialogue is there between other teachers. Oh, I've tried that with my primary four. Have you tried this? And I think that builds on teacher confidence, knowing that there are people in the authority, in their school, in their cluster, where they can go and just have an informal chat at the end of the day, or a probationer, I've got to teach this this term, have you got any ideas, is there any ways you could help, is there any resources? Um, so I think having our mentor network has been really important, I've found. Thank you. Ms. Tatsko. Um, I think teacher confidence is a big issue in STEM, uh, and I do agree that you know um, the approach has been quite variable across different authorities and different um, experiences for teachers. Um, unfortunately, where I am, there is no there is no real kind of mentoring approach, um, and while we, whilst we have had training, um, it has been I think of variable quality. Um, I think there was a really big push a couple of years back about STEM uh, within my, my own local authority, um, and there was a lot of um, time given to it. Um, but the, the approach that was given, it wasn't small groups where you know people had professional dialogue. It was a, a big room of a hundred people with you know various people sort of talking at you and giving you a, a kind of way forward to, to take a, on a certain initiative. Um, but there was no real follow up with that. So if you if you weren't particularly sure, if you weren't particularly confident, there was no one to really go and ask. Uh, and teachers were all at the sort of same level of we're we're kind of finding our feet our, our way through this, but we're not quite sure how. Um, so I think. There, there maybe needs to be a, a kind of a more consistent approach um, within STEM and within you know C CPD generally. Um, I think 
again, um, there is a bit of overload, which um, other people here have mentioned in terms of teacher workload. So while a lot of people are very enthusiastic about STEM, uh, they, they do feel a lot of pressure because STEM is not the only thing on their agenda or on their head teacher's agenda or on their school improvement plan. So there's a lot of things being asked of teachers right now, and STEM is only one of them. Uh, so it's about finding the time. And uh, again, if that is your particular enthusiasm or if that is something you want to work on and focus on for your own um, professional learning, then you might you might choose that, but um, if it's not, then you might find yourself pulled in a lot of different directions. Um, I do think also um, the the sort of sustainability of um, what teachers are being asked to do, because in my, my own experience of STEM was, as I say, very enthusiastic at the start. But if your own experiences aren't positive, then it's something that you maybe aren't going to take forward in your classroom in a positive way. So um, a lot of it has even been about just basic resources of we're being asked to build things, but we don't have the materials to build them with um, and things like that. So that makes that makes things very difficult. OK, Ms. Thomas. Yes. I'd just like to add to that the CERC, um, the CERC cluster mentor programme has been really highly well received and the CERC um, remote delivery that Highland Council have been able to access even though they're miles from Dunfermline that has been really positive impact on um, teacher confidence. Also I think the probationary teaching um, CPD to them that's been because we're getting people when they're in their start at the start of their career and that's been a really positive experience to try and increase uh, practitioner confidence as well. Okay, Mr. Lancashire. Uh, yeah, I, I suppose the, uh, the consistent feedback we've had from the teacher training sessions that we run at YESE is that, that, that many teachers uh, acknowledge they, they lack confidence moving the programme forward. Uh, once the kits are out, once the outcomes are delivered, they're very appreciative of those. I, I think there's some something here about that continuous professional development in this area that seems to be lacking, whether that's a mentoring approach, whether that is further contact with YSC and the regional coordinators and, and the STEM ambassadors. But it seems like we, we get to a point where we've done the training, the kits are there, the kids are ready to go, but we then hand-holding goals, there's no other further support there as well. I think as well, if you break STEM down, you start looking at AI and digital, I think more of a critical concern for me is uh, the lack of computer science teachers within uh, the education system, how we recruit and retain that might support better confidence in schools around this type of area within STEM-based uh, subjects as well. I think it's something we, we really need to conquer and move forward. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Um, yeah, briefly, yes. I suppose the, the, uh, the observation I'd make is that the, I mean, the STEM strategy is very welcome and it has some pretty black and white figures in it. The one I remember, I think, is 85,000 or 83,000 practitioners, whether early years, primary, secondary, who, generally speaking, it is viewed require more help in teaching STEM subjects. So whilst there are great examples of CLPL around, for me, the, the problem is that they're in the wrong order of magnitude of capacity. You know, they're delivering a few hundreds, maybe a couple of thousand a year. That doesn't stack up well against 85,000. And so I think, for me, that the frustration is the scale at which things are delivered. There are great examples of things that can be done. We've heard of, of, of a few here. It's just that somehow, as a nation, we're doing it with the wrong number of zeros at the end of it. And we need to find a mechanism that scales up. OK, I'm going to move on to Dr Allen. Thank you very much. Um, one theme that we've um, uh, approached um, or asked witnesses about with, I think, scientific consistency in previous panels has uh, been about the issue of um, both deprivation and rurality when it comes to ensuring that um, children, young people have uh, equal access to science in, in school. And I just wondered if initially you had any uh, observations about your own experiences of that uh, as teachers and others um, when it comes to uh, ensuring that that equity of access is there. So when, uh, when we run uh, training courses, we'll run 
one in Inverness, which is most central for the most teachers in our area, but we actually go out to rural areas. And so we've had some it's small numbers of people, but people are so appreciative that we've gone out and we provided the CPD. So we're there and we're able, as Nicola said, that discussion element, which is so important, getting people together. We're also trialling out remote delivery so that uh, we're using Highland schools have been given Chromebooks. So we're um, using the, the Google Hangout, Google Meet facilities to try and, um, again, it's, can, then it can be individual teachers who can't manage even their nearest school half an hour, three quarters of an hour away, so they can't get to an evening session evening, but to provide them with some, um, some high quality input. So that's what we're trialling at the moment. Um, I think uh, the issue of deprivation is a, is a really big one. The school I work in just now has quite a mixed socio-economic um, sort of demographic, and um, we find that um, there's huge issues. We, we were given a lot of PEF money and, and other funding, um, and it hasn't it hasn't really touched the sides. Uh, when it comes to um, initiatives like STEM, again, we're, we're, we're up against it in terms of materials and things like that. Um, and I think um, other, other issues are things like homework, because uh, a lot of what um, we sort of rely on is children being able to access stuff at home online. A lot of children don't have that. Um, and a, a lot of the things that we rely on as well is parental involvement and parental engagement. And a lot of... Um, times parents either can't, you know, for practical reasons that they're at work and they're working shifts and they don't have time to sit, you know, and talk about, you know, various bits of homework with children. And a lot of time parents don't feel confident in engaging with these kind of subjects because it wasn't something they had strengths in themselves when, when they were at school. So I think there's huge issues around um, deprivation and the sort of inequity of the sort of access to science-based um, teaching. If I may pick up on, on that very point, I just was curious uh, to know also whether um, there was any good practice, I'm sure there is, amongst schools in, in actively trying to engage that parental group of, of parents who don't have confidence about talking about science at all, or, as you say, for reasons of deprivation, may not have had a, a good experience of, of, of education themselves. I'm not, I'm not too sure about that particular group. Certainly my own school, we do try to have parental engagement and we do have a lot of that. We have you know, people who are um, you know, pharmacists or whatever coming in and, and trying to engage with children and things like that. But I think there is, is um, the kind of inroads to, to with parents who are you know, not confident themselves. I think that's been quite a slow, a slow um, uptake uh, and I'm not really sure what the solution to that would be. Um. Mr. Lancashire first. Just call me Matt, it's fine. <laughs> um, just, just very quick on the rurality side of things. It's, uh, obviously, it is an issue in terms of uh, the geographical nature of Scotland in terms of access to young people and the STEM opportunities and, uh, and the YSC clubs. But at SCDI, because of our um, committees, our Highlands and Islands committees, our North East Committee and our South of Scotland Committee coming on stream soon, uh, we take a real pride in terms of that geographical engagement with schools. So right now in Shetland Isles, 79% of primary schools are now, I've got a registered YSE club, 100% of secondary schools have a registered YSE club. Likewise, in, in the Western Isles, 83% of the primary schools have got a YSE club. And 100%. I know what you're going to say there, but you know that that's exactly where we are. But and we want to expand that and continue that engagement. I think the issue is is how many children come along to those clubs and and, and actually participate. That the there is infrastructure there to support uh, via the YSE clubs. It's how we encourage and motivate the children to come along. And at the second time, that might be alluded back to to Nikki's point around parental motivation and support for their children to participate as well but the infrastructure is there maybe there's a role for YSE in that in terms of the ambassadors and the coordinators to help in terms of that motivation and spreading that message amongst parents and and the wider communities um, in these far-flung areas point I think um, what we sometimes forget is that for parents who are um, struggling in terms of their sort of own financial background and their own issues STEM is maybe not their priority you know they're sort of prioritizing other things and 
well. Yeah, I was just going to say about the parental engagement that there's been numerous examples and cited of them um, family run STEM clubs where um, because the children are so enthused by what's going on and the activities speak for themselves that they're almost dragging their parents along to it. Again, a barrier to that is that I suppose it relies on an adult, a parent in the school or a teacher or a STEM ambassador to, to give up their time to run it. But when they've been run and they've been run successful, just um, fantastic response to STEM and the activities and that parental engagement. Connor, did you want... Um, yeah. just, I think in terms of um, my own school, I think we're very lucky that parents do come in and they are engaged. Um, we have, I think, all parents as partners in learning. Um, every term, we're, dates are given out to parents because a lot of our parents obviously are working and, and during the day. Um, so we try and give as much notice as possible. But they come in in the afternoon and we've maybe had a STEM focus or a writing focus or a health and wellbeing focus. And it's about what their child is learning about that in, in school at that time. Um, but I know that that is something that, as a school, we are looking at for next year to engage more parents, because obviously it is more important when looking at gender balance and conscious bias that parents do have a part in that to play as well. So it's important to get them on board as early as possible. Um, when there's, I was reading that there was, um, within the early years, some children have already decided what jobs they can and can't do from primary one, primary two, and that's certainly something through discussions I've had, interesting ones, with primary ones that I have found that actually there are children girls tell me they can't be firefighters or um, girls, saying, boy, girls and boys saying that farmers can only be male because they have to have a wife, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so there's, there's certain things and I think having parental engagement and getting parents involved is very important um, within that. Dr Gage. Um, speaking to the r rurality and uh, the, um, accessing children in, in areas of deprivation, uh, I mean, it's stating the obvious, but G Generation Science is a touring programme. It goes to the schools we decide it's going to go to, and it does go to schools with, you know, 30 pupils in at the end of a small road somewhere. Um, or, or equally, it goes into, I mean, 30% of our schools are in the top uh, quintile of the um, SIMD re register. So you, if you're touring, you choose your audience. Um, the, the, in, in fact, Generation Science is the biggest science touring programme in the UK. Uh, and um, but it comes at a price. You know, it costs us five hundred pounds per time we show up in a school to do that. But there are there are mechanisms, well worn mechanisms, and we often describe it as being sort of science delivery on an industrial scale. There are a fleet of sixteen vehicles with teams on the road for twelve weeks doing this. So it is entirely possible to go to exactly the people you want to go to. You just need to be able to pick your stuff up and go to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you. Resources have been mentioned quite a few times, and Dr Cage, you mentioned the STEM strategy, which has got, has got some really, you know, big ambitions in there. Um, uh, but we heard, heard from one of the witnesses already that one of the biggest, is, biggest um, problems in delivering IT and computing uh, is lack of Wi-Fi access. So we've, we've heard about, um, you know, infrastructure issues. We're hearing about resource issues and things. Um, it, it's, you know, w w what's your opinion about the support behind the STEM strategy? Is there enough support there to, to actually achieve some of the ambitions in it? From a West Lothian Council point of view, we are very lucky that we do have the support in place and the um, digital, uh, so that children can bring in their own digital um, appliances and use them in class and are able to use the Wi-Fi. So I think in terms of our, I can't really comment much on that and that we have that support and resource in place just now. Thank you. Uh, Dr Cage? No, they're not <laughs> enough. I can't see how they can be any, anywhere near enough. I mean, it, I mean, just going back to that number, 85,000 people need help some sort of professional development in, in, their, in, in the way that they bring science and technology alive to the young people they're working with. They need, they need the resources, they need the technicians. Um, I, I just don't see how you do that in a convincing way at a national level without spending tens of millions of pounds rather than a small number. And coming back to the question from about the international perspective, one thing you do see is other people spending tens of millions of dollars, whatever it is. Um, so I, 
I, I, yeah, and I've sort of watched this this discussion for 30 years in Scotland, and I have to say, many, whilst the STEM strategy is extremely welcome, it feels like a rerun of things that have gone before. And I think if we really want to make a difference, we have to take this much more seriously and put much more resource into it. Okay. Um, I'll take Mr. Lancashire and then. Um, I, I, I think the, the, the STEM strategy is very much welcome, but, but our world is changing. We're, we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution, data and I are seen as the new oil as such. And I think in terms of resources, I think there needs to be a higher level strategy across Scottish Government around a national strategy for AI and data, where the STEM strategy is well can feed in and connect to about how we realise the opportunities of AI and data across the economy, across our climate, across education, across skills. And that's where the STEM strategy should fit. And if that was the case, I would suspect some of the resource issues we are seeing or infrastructure issues around connectivity or support for teachers would be resolved because there is a bigger prize that our children can go into great new high jobs, high level jobs, working in cutting edge technology, overcoming some of the uh, greatest challenges in our society around climate change and, and, and uh, ageing society and such so as well. So I think I'll call it SCDI and YSC is that grander plan around a national AI and data strategy for Scotland. Thank you. Ms Thomas. Uh, regarding resources and um, I think particularly at the early years level that there's a danger that you spend money on resources but it's just going to sit in a cupboard and gathering dust. We always try and go for a sort of STEM on a shoestring approach, so trying to infuse the teachers and teachers who are not confident, so using resources that are readily available to them. And I know in the bigger picture, the wider picture, that yes, we do want our children to be familiar with the technology, but if we don't have the practitioners who are confident using it yet, let's start and get the practitioners infused about STEM and what they can do with STEM and what's within their capability and the resources that are around them. And then let's make that sustainable two, three, four years' time. We can maybe bring in the bigger technology that we might be using. But I think the biggest issue at the moment is just to get the people infused and confident using the resources that they've got at the moment and what's readily available to them. I think that's Oh, yes, Ms. Descript. Um, I think that resourcing across Scotland has been quite piecemeal, so some, some areas have invested in it in more than others, uh, and I think that's probably quite problematic. Um, I don't really agree with my colleague here about you know resources sitting in a cupboard because as a teacher, any resource I'm given, I, I grab it and I take it and I use it. Um, so I, I think there needs to be more investment in it and I think um, we've suffered a lot from austerity because it's not just teachers in classrooms. There, there's a knock-on effect with things like technicians in secondary schools and I know we we're here to talk mainly about primary but you know when technicians are you know um, few and far between on the ground or they're not no longer employed during the holidays and they can't maintain equipment or they can't set things up for teachers or they can't you know, do, do the things that they used to do. It does have a knock-on effect and again it is another kind of workload issue as well for teachers. So I think there's, I think that it needs to be looked at in a much more broader sense um, instead of just, you know, it's not just about you know, having batteries and having chemicals and having whatever you need to hand. It's about a bigger picture approach. Okay, I'm going to move to Mr Creer. Computer. I'd like to come back to the issues around deprivation, but I suppose this first question would apply to deprivation, rurality, issues around gender. I'm interested in um, consistency of approach when uh, best practice is found and is found to be working. From your e experience, how well shared is that? How well rolled out is it? Or is it the case that something works really well for a couple of years, but the funding pot that it came from changes, priorities change, we then move away from it and a few years later the wheel is reinvented to try and come up with the same best practice again? Or is, are we finding we're getting to a point now where best practice is actually being bedded in um, and uh, bedded in out with the school or the cluster of schools that uh, were first pioneering it? 
Mr. Scott. Again, I think it's very variable because my own local authority, I think, are still kind of baby steps towards things like that. And you talked about changing priorities. I think that happens quite a lot because we're asked to um, focus on STEM, but my colleague mentioned earlier, literacy, numeracy, health and wellbeing are, are what's on everybody's schooling in improvement plan. Um, we're hit with other initiatives like one plus two languages and outdoor learning. And again, um, if you're enthusiastic about those things, those those are the things that you might want to um, you know focus on. So. I I think um, in terms of best practice, um, you know, teachers share with each other and I think teachers are very collegiate, um, but I think again it needs to be a kind of more consistent approach and a, a broader strategy and I, I don't think that bedding in thing has happened yet. I would say from experience from the cluster programme, which we did 2016-2017, we still have our cluster mentors continuing even though the programme is finished. And out with the, the Sustain and Extend programme we're doing just now, we still continue to meet and we still continue to look at plans or progression or transition for the primary sevens into our, our high school. Um, so it was on the, the merit, I suppose, and the enthusiasm from the teachers that that was continued, um, which we do ourselves. Um, but the support from our head teachers and the support from um, out with the cluster is still, is still there and they're um, thankful that we're still continuing what we're doing. So. We've tried a, a cluster approach in Highland, but we've suffered from staff moving on. So we've had issues that we haven't been able to have those discussions and that get together. But that has been the beauty of being part of the RAISE network and that we've seen good examples elsewhere and we've been able to share them with people. And um, through that sharing, we're hoping that that will become, they will become embedded. Looking at um, industry involvement, which is something that's come up quite a lot in the evidence that we've taken on this, that getting industry into schools can have a really positive effect in conjunction with teaching staff. Um, there's an obvious challenge there when it comes to rural communities for whom the, some of the industries that are relevant are, are not particularly proximate to the schools. In your experience, how easy or, or not is it uh, where it's areas of uh, deprivation? We've seen plenty of really good examples uh, of getting industry into schools, but in areas where plenty of the teachers are themselves engineers, computing scientists, etc. But in an area of deprivation where there's not necessarily those parental connections and those local networks, how easy have you found it to bring industry into particularly a primary setting? I have my colleagues organised um, Loch Aber STEM Fair, so it's been local industries to the Loch Aber area, and it's been because it's now well, it's run for two years. It's going to run next year because the primary sixes are going to take on the running of it. And that's proved really successful in getting the Loch Aber local area industry into that. Um, because it's run one year and then it was, again, bigger the next year and hoping it'll be bigger again next year. So there are ways of doing it. It's able. The, um, I know that the STEM ambassador network, we suffer from that because... It's based at Aberdeen Science Centre and, of course, it's covering seven local authorities. I think there's 300 STEM ambassadors signed up for Highland Region, but obviously their commitment once a year and spread out. We've not had so much success in using the STEM ambassador network. Somebody was su suggesting that perhaps their commitment should raise from one industry visit, uh, school visit a year to, well, she was suggesting six visits a year. But um, we have suffered with the STEM ambassador network. Mr. Lancashire and then Dr. Gage to come in. Thanks. So, so the, the, the YSC network is predominantly industry funded uh, from across Scotland. And, and one of its guiding principles, which supports industry as well in terms of, uh, of their thinking, is diversity and, and gender equality. Um, the amount of schools that were in, that I said previously, industry take that seriously in terms of people coming into their business from different diverse backgrounds to support their industry succeeding. So we work very closely with industry to ensure areas of deprivation and rural areas actually have a representative or a STEM ambassador to try and encourage, motivate children to take part in the clubs. And where there is a local regional challenge, because I've just mentioned earlier, our regional committees generally have representatives of industries that are prominent to that area. I mean, Highlands and Islands will be very different to the industries in the south of Scotland, so we try and align that 
as best we can moving forward. Um, could more be done? Absolutely. Um, I think where we've found success is where we've coalesced people around our annual regional celebration, where we have a range of about 40, 50 businesses in Scotland where the, the kids get to show off what they've been doing all year and they celebrate all the different projects that they work on. But the kids are coming from the Western Isles, they're coming from the borders, they're coming from the west of Scotland, Ayrshire, etc. all engaging with business uh, from the likes of Shell to the likes of BT to the likes of uh, Diageo, etc. Uh, as well. So that opportunity is there uh, in different ways that are local and national level to engage with industry and find out how, how your career might develop in the future or your interest might develop into a, a career in the future. From, from the industry's point of view, is the demand from schools roughly comparable between schools in more and less deprived areas? Are you finding that schools from in areas of a particular socioeconomic background, there's more demand, more appetite? Um, to be fair, I don't think we've drilled down into the figures as, as much as we could there, uh, and I'm willing to come back to you on that, uh, absolutely. Um, what I would say is that we, we go out to every school that we can do, no matter class, background, geography, and try and engage with the teachers and the children to try and give them the opportunity to engage in uh, an interest in STEM and progress their opportunities within that. Um, but yeah, we can drill down a little bit into those figures, but we certainly don't self-select the schools we work with, hence why we're in the Western Isle from a rurality perspective. Hence why we're in some of the toughest neighbourhoods and areas in Scotland trying to provide this great network and that's been industry funded for the past 35 years. Dr Cage, you wanted to come in and then yeah. a couple of I think you put your finger on a difficult problem. How do you get industry specialists into schools in areas where there's, those industries aren't represented? I don't know the answer. Um, but echoing Matt, Matt's example, our careers event aimed at secondary school pupils, not primary school pupils, um, does a fine job of exposing people who live in rural communities or, or areas where a certain type of industry is prevalent to a great breadth of industries by bringing them to one place. So we bring them into Edinburgh and we have busloads coming from Lanarkshire, the borders, even from, I think, even from the Highlands. And they're exposed to people who make satellites, they make um, whiskey, they make um, all sorts of te te technological things uh, in the company of about 130 industry volunteers, early stage uh, industry volunteers who we've trained to talk well. So I, I, it's, it's a good model, the, the focal place where you assist others to come into um, is is efficient and um, effective, I think. And uh, we would ha happily run that uh, model across the country. Uh, and we're even trying to do that. Ms. Connor, you wanted to come in? Yeah. It was just, um, I have to disagree about the STEM ambassadors. Uh, we have uh, STEM East, who have been fantastic in coming across to schools across West Lothian, who have organised and they um, have taken part in Teach Meets in West Lothian to share what they do with all the schools in West Lothian. Um, I think we've had various engineers, different uh, te scientists come into the school, um, but also I think taking part in the Primary uh, Engineers Leaders Award um, as a whole school approach, getting a whole school about different types of engineering, I think has been really important. And again, that practice um, has been shared with schools across West Lothian. And I know other schools this year have taken part, maybe in more deprived areas in West Lothian, um, having enjoyed having the experience of the engineers coming in, being able to ask them questions about their jobs and the skills that they've been doing. Um, so they found that very valuable as well. Ms. Tess Gupta was wanting to go in. I'll come to you after that, Ms. Thomas. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> as a teacher, um, I really welcome and value partnership with industry and partnership with business. But I also really value um, the fact that education is not just about employability. Education is wider, you know, and it's about, um, you know, the whole person, the whole child. So I think we need to remember as well that, you know, not every child is going to be STEM focused and that we need to um, celebrate and support children who are interested in other things as well. And even those children that are interested in STEM might not necessarily um, 
segue into a STEM career. Um, so it's not just about um, business and industry, it's about a wider, a wider thing. Ms. Thomas. It's just great to hear that the STEM Ambassador Network, I think it's that Highland's suffering, well, not just Highland, the Northern Alliance area, again, that's where the rurality comes into it. But just wanted to add that I think um, the tide's changing, the industry seems so keen to get into schools. And we've had initiatives where we've had like the Academy 9, so we've got big infrastructure projects and the engineers and the work that's gone on into all the schools in that area has been incredible. Again, with the a96 and um, Port of Cromarty Firth, which is undergoing revamp and all the industry <coughs> that are associated with that revamp, so keen to get out into areas in those the, um, in that sort of deprivation areas and working there. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McKay. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Yes, I wanted to return to um, something Nicola Connor was talking about, um, gender stereotyping in, in early, um, early years in, in primary. Um, we know that gender stereotypes are, are deep, deeply ingrained. One of our um, witnesses, um, Elizabeth Kelly, had said that um, teachers, them, she thought teachers themselves are still learning to better understand their own unconscious bias. So I wonder if you think there's enough training going into early years in primary um, training um, about, you know, encouraging teachers to overcome that and, and uh, you know, to see it through. And, and also, how do you carry on if you, if you can um, have a successful um, pedagogy around um, um, early years? How does it carry on to primary when the pressures on teachers become, you know, different? In terms of training, I don't think there is very much, if I'm honest. Um, it's only through either reading that I've been doing personally, through everything that I've been doing in the, the authority of the cluster. Um, it's coming into contact with people like Heather Earnshaw, who's been looking at the gender balance. I think she's now Education Scotland as well, um, and having good discussions with her. Um, and just making people more aware um, of and staff of possibly that they have an unconscious bias and that there is some things that maybe from their culture or their childhood that might impose upon um, how they're teaching something or how they're, they're disseminating it in a classroom. Um, but I think in terms of through a primary school and through early years, I think we're very good as teachers during maybe World of Work Week or through different discussions. I know I've had many discussions about skills we've been learning in a science lesson or why are we learning this skill? Why is this important in maths, for example? Why, is, why are we learning money? Why is this important? What are we going to use it for? I think those are discussions that are important to have in a classroom. Um, and I think those are the discussions that are happening through schools and through classrooms across Scotland. Um, I don't think that's not happening. Um, but it is interesting when you're having those conversations with children that they're coming either from home or from somewhere else where for example, um, we were doing developing young workforce agenda last school year, last session, and I took some children aside um, who get pay funding, and asked we asked them what do you want to be when you grow up, and it was from I did primary one to primary three, my colleague did primary four to primary seven, and the answers we got were based on what they saw parents doing or someone in a family role was already doing. They had no inspiration or or um, thought about any other jobs. We had one YouTuber, um, which made me sad. <laughs> but the rest were based on family jobs. Um, so I think, again, it all ties in. Everything that we do in school is just as equally as important as getting parents involved, getting families involved. Um, I know that through doing science in the school, I've had conversations with children where I've said, who can be a scientist? And they said, well, anybody can, because you do science, so it must be for everybody. So I think having, having someone in school uh, to either be a role model or a positive impact, uh, I think is important as well. Um, but yeah, no, I think in terms of training, I think more could be done for that. Because yeah. obviously, you, you know, you're a key, key influencer, obviously, outside of the home, but do you find that you, you can take the parents on board or do you get any resistance? Absolutely, no, okay. we, we have uh, positive... I've not come across an unpositive parent um, in my time. Mm -hmm. um, and when we were doing our Developing Young Workforce Agenda, I was looking at science and STEM. We had a parent focus group in who were looking at our action plan with us um, for the year and then they evaluated and helped us at the end of the year to evaluate our practice and what they felt as a school we'd done well and what they thought our next steps could be as well. So in terms of 
um, parents wanting to be involved where there's time and where their ability is, um, I think they do want to be to be involved in some way. Yes. I think that, um, we would certainly welcome more training. I think I agree with my colleague that there's really not enough there. Um, in terms of um, role models, um, I think we'd like to see a lot more people involved. Uh, and the primary sector is um, predominantly, you know, primary teachers are predominantly women. Uh, I think that's a, a good thing in terms of we are, we are the scientists in our classrooms and we are showing children that. Uh, I don't think parents aren't positive, but I do think sometimes they can be a wee bit intimidated or a wee bit overwhelmed. And I've had similar experiences as my colleague in terms of um, children and particularly girls not seeing themselves in the future in those kind of roles because they just think it's not for them, you know, it's not something that they can aspire to. Um, I think as well in sort of general terms women have kind of been written out of history in terms of science and their contribution and I think we could do more to kind of redress that balance if it, you know, in some way as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I welcome the, the uh, let's get it right then, is it inclusion gender balance team that they've got their the six posts within Education Scotland and I welcome the fact that they're going to go out and they're going to deliver training and with the aim of delivering it to all schools by, is it 20, I can't remember it, the 2022, would that be right? I just question how feasible it is for six officers to go out and to do that when it is such a big wide remit, but I, I really welcome the training that's going to be made available to teachers upcoming in the future. Anyone else want to? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah um, absolutely. I mean, the YSC has integrated the top 10 tips for teachers uh, for the Institute of Physics into its practices, resources and training and, and live and breathe by that in terms of how they uh, communicate, engage and support teachers to uh, ensure that uh, gender inclusion is part of the initiative of YSC. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of the overcoming certain practices. Um, however, teachers uh, need the support uh, and continued training and, and continued resources to be able to support them achieve uh, that gender diversity within STEM-based subjects and STEM-based careers later on in life uh, going forward. Can I maybe ask Dr Gage, um, internationally, is it a different picture? Um, um, not that I am aware of. No, I think it's a prevalent problem. Actually, I refer back to the ROSE study, which is a body of research that actually unpicks some of this and identifies why it is that young women get turned off from science. And whilst I don't know the research inside out, one of the aspects I do recall is that they, they regard it as antisocial. It is not social enough. Uh, and you, that comes out in the research very clearly. And so if you count, can counter some of those misconceptions about how you're going to be in, in an isolated role, you, you make some steps, some progress. Um, it, it's a common problem everywhere. There's some good work out there, I think, about providing good role models. I did see one piece of research probably 10 years ago that actually showed that children acquire, predominantly acquire their perception that science is for men only from teachers. Um, so to ask whether there should be greater training in this issue in the teaching profession, I think is exactly the right question to ask. Okay. Just very quickly, and, and it is on gender, but it's, it's wider diversity and underrepresentation of a number of different groups, whether it be ethnic minorities, LGBT groups, uh, disability uh, 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 as well, that we, we also need to focus on in this debate. Yes, gender is critically important, but these other groups as well are just as important in terms of we want those inclusive, productive workplaces of the future. All these groups matter in terms of engaging them in into STEM-based uh, opportunities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's cool, supplementary to Catherine Thomas about the role of Education Scotland. Um, you mentioned the development officers who will now be working nationally. Um, is there a role, do you think, for school inspections and perhaps for the practitioners as well to look more specifically at this issue? Um, I don't think I know enough about the school inspection process. I only know it from a, the primary school teacher level to answer that question. 
I actually That's would appreciate so. it from a primary teacher level <laughs> because as a, a practitioner, um, you know, in the classroom, could school inspections help to support that work, do you think? I think, well, experiences of inspection are very worrying times for teachers when the inspectors are coming in. And although the schools, that when they've gone through them recently, they said it's actually been a really supportive process. So I guess from that perspective, from people afterwards, that I suppose, yes, the inspectors could sit down and they could talk about what's going on and provide guidance as to moving forward. But it's just you're talking about teachers who are already feeling quite stressed out and the word inspection tends to bring out a stressed out response yeah. as well. So I think there are better mechanisms through supportive training, through supportive mentoring, through supportive networks. I think that would be more supportive role for Education Scotland mm -hmm. rather than specifically the education, the yeah. inspection focus. Mm -hmm. I don't know what my colleagues would think. I haven't been through an inspection, um, so I don't know what the process is like. Uh, I can only speak on terms of I've had a, a VSE, which is council level, um, and they were very supportive. And one of the things that they looked at was teachers leading uh, developments within the school. Um, and there was a number of us, health and wellbeing, STEM, DYW, that kind of thing. Um, and it was discussed about why we felt, how we supported, we felt by head teachers, about the, by the council. Um, and it came out very, as very kind of positive and that what we were doing as a school, um, being teachers of change and, and doing it that way, um, was very good. But in terms of support or things that comes from, that comes from my SLT, it comes from higher up my education officers within the council um, who have been very supportive, I have to say. Um, so again, I, I don't know from an inspection point of view, as, a, as, as yet, Touchwood, I haven't been through one. <laughs> teaching for about 15 years and I've been through two, two school inspections um, and my colleague is right it can be stressful and it can be a bit of a worrying time. Um, my own experience is that Education Scotland don't really take on that kind of role. Um, it can be quite remote sometimes from the classroom teacher. They're involved quite heavily with senior management and yes, they do come in and observe you. You, you have an occasion where you can um, get some feedback, but there doesn't seem, there, there's not that sort of dialogue where they, they tell you um, how they can support you in, in driving things forward. And again, I think the focus that I've seen has mainly been on um, health and wellbeing, literacy and numeracy rather than other areas of the curriculum. Because I think earlier on you'd said that sharing good practice needs to be done more consistently. So I wonder, therefore, do you think Education Scotland do have a role to play there and that they could be more hands-on in terms of offering that support? Absolutely. I think I think they, uh, there could be. I don't think the, the school inspector is the right mechanism for that, but I think yeah. Education Scotland could find a way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms Harris? I, I've been quite, in, well, quite interested in the idea that STEM should really include the arts and the humanities and therefore become more of a STEAM to, you know, moving forward. So I know there's limited application in this so far, but I um, we have heard from the University of Sheffield that this approach has been found to be quite useful in helping children increase not only their engagement but their motivation for STEM subjects. So I would really be quite interested in asking the panel what their thoughts are on that and whether you think there's a discussion to be had around this as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, um, again, it comes down to not segregating out the subjects, so it becomes far more integrated and it still links towards the literacy and the numeracy and the health and wellbeing. I know um, Ray's officers in Fife worked with Book Bag Scotland people to produce um, for the read write count bags that went out with parents and parental engagement to produce steam planners and um, for last year's books and that there's going to be uh, that's going to be done again this year so the books go out and there's plans that teachers can just access and they've got ready steam activities and that's practitioners really enjoy that really like that the plans there it's activities that they've got confidence that they can see that they can do and um, I think it's a win-win when you become, it's not isolated. It raises the science capital within the school, it's raising the profile of science, well, not just science, but that sort of the STEAM capital, if you like. And yeah, it's a very positive way of moving forward. Thank you.
As practitioners, we're all, always encouraged to take a kind of interdisciplinary approach anyway, certainly within the primary, and I think that probably happens a lot more. It's maybe not been branded that way, or it's not been um, advertised, if you like. Um, teachers don't shout about it because it's just a natural way of approaching things for us. Um, so it probably happens a lot more in schools than you might imagine, you know, the sort of expressive arts and other things coming into STEM. Uh, and I do think it, it has a massive impact on children because they, they love all of, all of that. It does increase engagement, it does increase enjoyment, it adds to what is a positive experience for them, and I would certainly welcome more of it. Thank you. We're, we're embracing it wholeheartedly, I suppose, but for us it's important to keep the science and the technology in with the art, so rather than, so to, to, to motivate people through their artistic aspirations, perhaps, to then use and learn and acquire new skills in technology. So we, we run all sorts of workshops on on making paintings that talk to you or well no they don't talk to you but they're you know that have flashy eyes or uh, making circuits with pencils and and um, carbon traces and things like that and that they're, they're the simple ones and then you can go on to digital sewing and all these sorts of things so I, I think it's great anything that motivates a young person to get involved and to acquire these new skills is a good thing. Thank you. Um, sorry, no, I'm just going to say, just, just going to add very quickly. I, I think it's increasingly important in disciplinary learning uh, as to where our economy shifts, uh, and adding up art and humanities in there that can, create, you know, teach further creativity, adaptability, flexibility. When we're talking about people having eight, nine, ten different jobs in, in their lifetimes is, is critical and to have a successful fourth industrial revolution economy as such in Scotland which we all desire that interdisciplinary learning is critical to allow those skills to flourish and, and create resilience adaptability flexibility and, and, and creativity on the technologies of the future Yep, with uh, Nicola as well. Um, I think that interdisciplinary learning is a big thing in, in primary and early years in primary one, um, where you are bundling outcomes or benchmarks together um, and ensuring that children know why they're learning it, how they're learning it, um, and the skills that go with it and the skills that are merged together. There's a lot of art you can get from science lessons. There's, there's lots of things you can do with technology to create art, music, um, and things. So I think there is a lot of good practice already happening to try and, and merge all of them together. Thank you. Just following on from uh, Ms Harris's line of question, I, I was um, meeting with the cadet organisations a few weeks ago and asked them about their STEM learning and they said, oh, we only do STEM by stealth. And that was because if they presented young people with a problem or a project or something to do, they, they got stuck in until they labelled it. And I just wondered if, if there are international examples, are people trying to reframe the language around STEM learning at all? Well, lots don't use the word STEM at all. <laughs> and I think there's an argument for not using it particularly. Um, uh, y yeah, yes, there, there are great examples. Exploratorium in San Francisco, for example, is, takes a holistic approach to learning that embraces the arts, culture. The Science Festival is a cultural organization. It involves humor, eating, drinking. Um, there, there are many, many good examples, yes, I think. Um, I think you, you just have to, I don't know, it's tricky. I mean, I'm so imbued with sciences and technology as just part of culture that it's hard for me to perhaps get a perspective on this. I can't point to anyone particularly that I would think, well, they've really solved it. They've really solved it. But I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I think we have to be cautious about talking to young people about STEM in the first place. Talking about creativity, problem solving, coming up with great ideas that are going to make the world a better place, um, being inventors, being creative, working in teams. That's the language I think that young people will respond to rather than it's time to do your STEM. Ms. Tesco. 
Um, I, would, I would agree with Dr um, Gage. I think it's really important to have that interdisciplinary approach and to have that kind of integration in the curriculum and not have it segregated and call it STEM. And I think we, we in schools sometimes have things like STEM week where you know there's going to be a big focus on STEM this week and we're all going to build and we're all going to make. Uh, and I, I don't agree with that approach. I think it should be um, across the cu curriculum. It should be much more integrated. It shouldn't just be a week here or a week there. I think partly that has come out of the fact that the curriculum is really overcrowded uh, and it's to make sure we fit it in. So we have a STEM week, we have a money week, we have an outdoor learning initiative, we have a focus on one plus two at another time and it's to ensure that we are ticking all of those boxes but I don't think education should be about ticking boxes. I think it should be about more than that and I think um, if, we can, if we can move away from that uh, and have a sort of genuine um, you know, focus on these things in a more natural way um, and head teachers not worrying about have I ticked this off my SIP plan, um, I think it would benefit us all. I think it would benefit children enormously. I think it would benefit teachers enormously. Uh, and I think um, it would, uh, just a different approach I think would be more helpful. Okay. Um, I've got one f final question if the committee um, are all happy. Um, and it's, it's to do, it's probably going back to something Mr. Like I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, and it's, it's something that actually drew the committee to this whole subject area, was the fourth industrial revolution and the sort of AI digital aspects of that. And, um, and you mentioned that you didn't think the digital strategy was, the, the, sorry, the STEM strategy as it is was enough at that moment. Can you give us an example of some of the elements that you think are missing and something that we need to be working harder on in those areas? Um. It's not necessarily anything's missing from, from the STEM strategy. It's more what's missing from overarching Scottish Government policy in terms of an AI and data strategy for Scotland across the economy, across skills and education, across health, that drive and move our economy forward to be world leading in these areas. I think the STEM strategy does try and focus on digital and does try and focus on improving digital schools and, 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 and children engaging in, in digital areas. And there's a variety of techniques that we've advocated in that. But it's only as good as having a national strategy that says, how do we become a world leading nation in AI and data across a range of different industries? How does AI and data help our health service? How does AI and data help us conquer some of the climate change issues that we have going forward and why is it a theme across all Scottish Government policy in one defined strategy that supports it where the STEM strategy could fit underneath. So it's not anything necessarily about the STEM strategy itself, it's more, more overarching, where does it fit? Why, why are we increasing people learning STEM if there's no jobs in STEM at the end of it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I get there's a reasons around opportunity and, 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 and people's self-worth and value and children's self-worth and value, but surely there's got to be an end point where we're taking industry forward, productivity forward and uh, social inclusion forward. That comes as part of that too and conquering some of those challenges of today and tomorrow. I think that's the end of our questions for this morning. Can I thank all the panel members? It's been very, very helpful, not only for your contributions today, but also for the information that you've provided to the committee in your written submissions. Uh, I'm just going to suspend briefly while we move on to, the, to allow the witnesses to leave while we move on to the next item. Um, which is an EU reporter uh, update uh, and invite Jenny Gilruth, our EU reporter to the committee to give us her paper. 
Officer. Thank you, Convener. Um, so, as the paper shows, the figures there from UCAS show a decline in the number of EU27 students applying for university places in Scotland. Uh, the figure in 2018 was 42,290, and the figure in 2019 was 41,350. Uh, as also detailed in the paper, University Scotland has highlighted concerns in relation to the European temporary uh, leave to remain proposal. And I want to highlight those concerns to the committee. It's on page three of the uh, briefing notes. And I welcome any thoughts from committee members on the detail in the paper. And I will provide a further update after the summer recess. Yeah. Any questions from Ms. Goldruth? Um, I, I thank you very much for the paper, um, Ms. Goldruth, and, and your update to the committee. I think the um, the two concerns that you raised in particular um, with regards to dropping numbers, but particularly the temporary leave to remain issue and the fact that it won't meet the requirements of a four-year degree. Um, uh, can I suggest that we write to the Home Secretary highlighting the committee's concern in that area? Are there any other areas we would like to highlight at this stage? No? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we look forward to an update in the autumn. Okay, thank you. If we could now move to um, agenda item three, which is Scottish National Standardised Assessments, and it's to consider the government response to the SNSA report. Um, we've received a comment from the government's response from Professor Lindsay Patterson, Connect, Upstart, Scotland, and the RSE, um, and invite uh, comments from members on the responses. Ms. Lamont, yeah. can I just say that? I'm genuinely very disappointed by this response. I think the committee as a whole came together, provided a very considered report with very substantial recommendations. And an awful lot of the body of the response is just basically saying, well, we said something, we believe something different. This is not our position. Um, I think um, Professor Patterson's comments and indeed all the other ones reflect that disappointment. And I think there are, you know, we could go through it and identify the number of areas, but I am, the, the, Around SSLN, I think there are, are real issues there. The question of IT as an example, we identified as a problem indeed in talking about more generally about STEM in schools. If you remember, somebody said the one thing you really need was better internet connection. We have a system that's relying on um, young people being able to access the test through um, ICT and saying that this is not possible is a big issue. And the response is basically, well, it's not really a big issue. I just found, I don't know what the, you want to do, convene around this, but I genuinely think we need to come back and look at this again. It's not acceptable, in my view, the Scottish Government to take a report and basically just say, well, we don't agree with you. I think there are some areas around, there's some stuff about um, assessment and explaining. It just, it just felt really odd um, and didn't really, in my view, match up to the seriousness of the report itself, which I think has been generally well received and recognised as, as a balanced report. Um, if we wanted the Cabinet Secretary just to revisit his own evidence to the committee, then we would have asked him to do that. We asked him to respond to the, a series of recommendations that the committee as a whole had agreed. Um, but um, I would be interested in what other committee members' views were on how we deal with that. Yeah, I, I, I bring in Liz and then Mr. Gray. I, I largely agree with that. I, I did think we went to considerable lengths as a committee to give a very balanced report and um, looked at it from uh, different angles. And uh, I thought we produced quite a good report, actually. Uh, and I think John's right, it's been quite well received. But this is almost saying, I'm sorry, but you're wrong, which I don't think is acceptable. I mean, it, you were saying it's not acceptable for the government to take a different view. No, picking up enough of the points okay. that we raised very legitimately as a committee, I don't think. Okay. Yeah, I think we would have expected some engagement, even whether there are, you know, he, the Cabinet Secretary is not going to agree with my view on the, the, the reality of uh, primary one testing, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't engage with the evidence that the committee had and the conclusions that we all came to. Um, I think round the survey, round data, missing round ICT are good examples where they've simply just, you know, and even when we've said we would like to look, you know, sort of kind of um, get an update on, on how it's all going, the response is, well, that's a matter for local authorities. And you, you can't really have it both ways. I just, I find, you know, yes, that that... I didn't expect the Cabinet Secretary to have a, um, a conversion in the road to Damascus and throw his hands up and say, I'm completely wrong. But I did expect him to engage, or the Scottish Government more generally to engage with some of the more serious the recommendations, even amongst which 
We as a committee don't agree on the fundamentals around the testing, but we did agree on these recommendations. I think they should have been taken more seriously. Mr Gray? I think um, it, it, John's right. It, it is um, to a degree about, about the kind of tone of the response. Uh, and I, I mean, yeah, Alistair's right too. You, the, you know, the committee's not in a position where they can order the, um, the minister to change his view. But a, a lot of the response here is simply repeating what, what the government said in the course of the, um, of the inquiry. We considered that, we considered the other evidence, and, and we took a view, and it, it really just doesn't acknowledge that um, at all, I think. So I thought the tone was pretty disappointing. And I find it quite worrying, because we're putting a great deal of effort in, including later today, to producing the report into um, subject choice and narrowing curriculum. And on a number of occasions, the Cabinet Secretary has said that he's waiting to see what that report says. So, for example, uh, when the Conservatives brought a debate on that topic, he was very critical of them and said, why are you doing this to uh, the, the reports to come? Well, you know, if, if the report's just going to pass him by completely, then that, that's a bit worrying. Now, I don't, know what, I don't know what we do. I don't know how we make that point, but I think it's uh, pretty disappointing, yeah. Any other comments? Or us, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to simply duplicate what other colleagues have said, but I, like everyone else, I wasn't expecting the government to come back and say, well, on the basis of, of your evidence, fair enough, we, we got this wrong. I would have appreciated, though, if they had come back and provided a detailed rebuttal of each of the points that we made or grappled with the evidence that we gathered and explained why it led them to a different conclusion. That's not the case. This could, they could have issued us this document before we started that inquiry, and that's my frustration with it. Is I would expect the government to explain why, on the basis of the same set of evidence, they came to different conclusions, and I'm, I'm not seeing that explanation yet. So, so what we could do is write to the government, point them to the official report of this meeting, and the other responses to the, the committee received to the report and ask them if they would consider um, further comment. Can I ask? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the, the point that um, Ian Gray makes about um, we can't direct government, but if a, a decision of the Parliament doesn't direct government, and the committees don't direct government round policy, then there's 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 a problem. We can have an argument back and forward about the policy, but if if there's not any way in which you can actually then influence that, I think the best way to influence it is the government to be open to actually to take very seriously what the committee says. And I, this was my my. Um, comment on writing back. I think I would quite like to have time to reflect on what I would like to see in, in that letter. Um, and perhaps people could contribute to that. Just as we look at the response, there are areas where, as I've said already, risk of repeat myself, we're not going to agree. But I think there are some quite serious points around, even if you accept the basic premise, the way in which it's now getting carried forward, you know, if the test can be at any point in the year, all of those kind of things. So I just think it would be good if we could all have the opportunity to feed into that. And perhaps then, but I recognise that the committee all might not, we would still have to agree what the letter would be. But I just think it's, I think there's some quite substantial things that I would like to see going into the letter. Okay. Are members content with that to come back on the agenda after the summer recess for a revisit? Okay. Thank you. Um, can I move into private session? Thank you.